wish to comment on the rules, please use the raise hand function. Somebody from our staff will call upon you and then you can go ahead and, and make your comment. Uh, I don't believe we have such a large uh, audience today that we need to limit the comments down to two minutes. Um, but if we start, if it starts dragging on or we get a, a lot more people joining, we may kind of institute a two minute rule for uh, people's uh, comments. Uh, if you are not speaking or you're not called upon to speak, please mute your microphone uh, so we don't get feedback. And uh, we'll get started here. Uh, can we go ahead and put up the agenda slide? Shortly. All right. So we've broken it out into kind of four main areas. The, the first group is sort of the, the, the public policy uh, issues that we're requesting people to input uh, provide input on. Uh, those include the licensing fees as well as the privilege fees. So licensing fees, how much uh, should the state charge for a uh, you know, license? And then the privilege fee is what would the uh, state uh, charge operators? Uh, then we're going to kind of move into three uh, issue sets. The first one uh, issue set will cover internal controls, servers and storage, and geofencing. Uh, issue set number two uh, will cover platforms, uh, integrity and security assessment, events and contests, and player accounts. And then the final set of issues we'll cover will be promotions and bonuses, minimum internal control standards, player disputes, uh, debt set off and any sort of miscellaneous rules. So we budgeted about three hours uh, for this session. We probably won't take all of it, uh, but if we do kind of get into a, a lengthier discussion, uh, we'll plan on taking a break at about 1030 if needed. But in the our experience in the last two sessions, uh, we were pretty much wrapped up within an hour to an hour. 20 minutes. So with that, I'll go ahead and open up the floor. And if anyone has any sort of input or uh, feedback on the licensing fees or privilege fees, anything you've seen in other states that you'd like to share with uh, us, uh, we'd be happy to hear that now. No. Any, any input on those two? Okay. Uh, okay, we'll go ahead and move on to, uh, I think we've got the wrong uh, draft and slide up there with the agenda, we'll get that switch. Uh, but the, any input on internal controls, server and storage and geofencing that anyone would like to share with the department? And again, if you'd like to uh, uh, comment, use the raise hand function. If you're joining by telephone, uh, you can send an email to publicaffairs at azgaming.gov uh, if you'd like to be recognized to speak. Just include your first name, last name, and uh, who you are affiliated with or who you represent. All right, it looks like Meredith. Hi, I'm Meredith Yu. I lead compliance for Yahoo Fantasy Sports. Um, I, I wanted to, to speak about the geofencing requirements, specifically uh, the requirement to um, check a player's location throughout the session. So no other jurisdictions where we currently operate have this requirement. We're typically seeing geolocation checks uh, required at the time of deposit or the time of entry, but having this requirement of, of checking a, a user's location throughout this, the session, techno technologically and financially, it, it's close to, you know, it, it would be very difficult. Okay, thank you, Meredith. I appreciate the input. Any, anyone else?
Okay, uh, I think that's it for issue set number one. We'll move on to issue set number two, platforms, integrity and security assessment, events and contests, and player accounts. Does anyone have any input they'd like to uh, share with the department on those uh, issues? Adam, the floor is yours. All right, Adam. Oh, hello. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear my name. Thank you. Um, so I'm Adam Booth from Price Picks. Um, we just want to thank uh, Arizona for allowing feedback from from relevant parties and also for uploading on Friday the YouTube video. It, it was undoubtedly save time um, as we were able to review uh, many of the recommendations from our colleagues. Um, on point uh, 216A, uh, Catalog of Fantasy Sports Contests, um, the ruling here or the, the recommended rule here is that um, DFS operators give a catalog, um, uh, or sorry, all fantasy operators provide a catalog um, of the markets they intend to use. Um, due to our fine, refined lines making expertise um, for, for companies such as ours, we were wondering what the approval process would be like if it would be relatively immediate. Uh, take, for instance, minor tennis tournaments, disc golf, esports, many markets that we specialize in um, that are, that are um, of great importance to our, to our members and users. Um, we're wondering if the, the state has an idea as to what would be approved and disapproved, uh, and if they could provide clarity as to uh, the process um, and uh, if there was an option for having that expedited. Um, as we all know, during COVID uh, and the traditional sports shutdown last year, many operators had to resort to providing esports and uh, Korean baseball and Nicaraguan soccer. So um, under you know, extraneous circumstances. We're wondering if the state has a has planned for um, you know last minute additions to a sporting market. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. I'm going to have uh, Warren Nichols uh, field that question, Warren. So, uh, so Adam, essentially the way that we have set it up is that um, any event that is approved under the under the rules of the statute uh, is is allowed to be utilized. So, if an event that, that meets those for fantasy sports and you have fantasy sport contests on those. Uh, it is allowed to be utilized at the beginning. Now, if there's anything that you know that we're not clear on, we'll certainly ask questions and, and check into it. But our expectation is that it'll be fairly immediate. All right, great, thank you. Any any other uh, questions or feedback on uh, issue set uh, number two? It looks like Meredith has raised her hand. All right, Meredith. Hi there. Um, again, Meredith Yu, Yahoo Fantasy Sports. I wanted to provide some comments on the player account information, specifically around identity verification. So um, the rules 19.4.218, you know, list a long laundry list of personally identifiable information that you guys are requesting that we collect and store for our users. This is typically um, you know, this list is more extensive than what we've seen in other jurisdictions and what we typically collect, specifically around um, government issued IDs, social, social security numbers. Um, this is not information that, that is typically stored. And so we ask that you guys would revisit um, the required information that, that you require us to maintain on all of our users. Okay. Thanks, Meredith. One thing I would just uh, say, however, on, on this subject, this is this is directed by the statute. Thank you. You bet. All right, Andrew. Andrew looks like his hands raised. Thank you, Andrew Winchell from FanDuel. Actually, to follow up on that point, because uh, I know there was a discussion on Friday about that. Uh, we've gone back through the statute and we are not seeing anywhere in the fantasy sports section that requires this information specifically to be delineated. Um, we would appreciate if, if the you know, department could point us in that direction, but we're not seeing in the fantasy sports section the requirement to maintain uh, a document, you know, the, the government issued ID or, or other items that are listed here. All right, Warren. So, uh, Andrew, th that section requires either a social security number or driver's license number. So, by our way of thinking, if you get one of those two, they're both government-issued identifications. Right, but th this is 
the 194218 first well, I would say first off again don't necessarily see that in in, in the player account section in fantasy um, they talk about you know having to keep records of what you of, of the player account and when it's created in the player's information but it doesn't say I don't again looked it over this morning didn't see uh, where it says government issued ID or social in the fantasy sports section but uh, R194218D requires in that the player account file must include and list out all these items. So even if we verified only on the last four of the social, and we didn't, and our verification process did not use a government issued ID, um, like a driver's license or, or elsewhere, that it appears that we need to actually keep a copy of the document or record number for for the, the separate. So you. So you're saying that the that D nine is duplicative of D three? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's an update that we can make is to is to make that clear that that is duplicative. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Andrew. I anyone else on uh, issue set number two? And again, if you're joining by phone and you wish to speak, go ahead and you can send an email to publicaffairs, all one word, at azgaming.gov. Uh, just give your first name, last name, and who you're affiliated with, uh, and we'll call upon you. All right. Uh, I think we'll move on to issue set number three, promotion and bonuses, minimum internal control standards, uh, audit. Uh, let's see, player disputes, debt set off, uh, and any other miscellaneous rules that you'd like to address with the department. Director Kevin uh, raised his hand right before you went into issue set three. Okay. Kevin, you got in on the, uh, the, the last minute, so feel free to comment on issue set two or three. Perfect, thank you. Um, Kevin Cochran with DraftKings. I, I was just trying to follow that conversation and make sure I, I know where we ended up. So we, we are saying that the statute is dictating that an operator have to receive a social or government issued ID because when I when I look through the statute as well, I came to the conclusion that information was only needed for self exclusion of, of players and not necessarily for account creation. So I just want to just make sure my notes are correct and where I'm following where the conversation ended up. Okay. Uh, we will also go back and check. Um, and you know, based on that, we'll make any sort of updates to our to our rules. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay. Any any other? Meredith has raised her hand, followed by Adam. All right, Meredith. Hi there, for issue set three, I also wanted to just speak upon the requirement of a, the, an internal audit function. Um, typically we rely on the annual financial and compliance audits being performed by a, an external third party. And so any requirements of an internal audit function is new and something that we've, we've never seen before. So we would ask um, that you guys revisit any requirements of an, an internal audit function. Okay, great. Thank you, Meredith. And then Max, who was up next? Adam Booth. All right. Hi. Hello. Um, on a similar um, thread to my previous concern, um, under 221 promotions and bonuses, um, operators would need to submit written notification of promos and bonuses to be provided prior to implementing, just um, with that same uh, context of immediacy there was no comment on whether there would be approval or rejection from the department so our concern is what would be the rules um a specific time um as you know a game seven promotion or something happening in a a, um, a bad beat circumstance that many operators on both sports betting and fantasy uh, fronts run um so we would just want to uh, maintain that uh, there's some flexibility and um, that there is no uh, uh, opportunity for uh, rejection. All right, thanks, Adam. Uh, Warren? 
So, uh, Adam, yeah, the, the way that's written, there is no uh, time frame associated with it, nor is there an approval. It would just allow us to have them on file. Okay. Uh, any Andrew, pardon, Andrew's back up. All right. Thank you again. The um, in the rules, let me just pull up my note here. My apologies. Um, in rule reference R nineteen four dash one fifty three A, there's a requirement that uh, when there's a patron dispute, the operator needs to notify the player of the right to file a written complaint and shall include the pr procedure for filing such written complaint and we completely agree with that but then it also at the end provides that we have to give them information about the complaint resolution process um and we're not aware of other, other jurisdictions where we're required to provide that kind of information and it's information is probably better provided by the regulator directly to the the, the customer because we aren't able to necessarily explain you know properly i would say explain to them what they should expect from the process when filing a complaint with the regulator because we would be speaking on your behalf as to how you are going to process their complaint okay great and just just for the record andrew the the rule you cited there is an event wagering uh that's okay for oh, some right. remarks down but more oh, okay do you have anything you yeah so so andrew our, our intention on this one uh, and for the rest of the group as well is is not that you explain the process but simply that there is some kind of identification that they can go to the department uh, so it, you know it may just be a, a link to the department or a statement that you can you know uh, forward your complaint to the department if it's not resolved to your uh, to your expectation it, it doesn't have to be the entire process just some identification to them uh, of how to get to the department because they may not know that part of it understood and, and thank you for that and uh i i agree with that and that's that's what it appears to be in the first half of the sentence um, and then that was, I guess, our concern was the second half seemed to be something beyond that. Yeah. Thank you. You're saying, okay. But thank you. Sure. Thank you. Great. All right. Any any comments on any part of the fantasy sport uh, rules? Meredith has raised her hand. All right. Hi. Hi there. Similar to Andrew's comments about um, investigations and providing. Um, details to a player on the nature of the investigation. We do have some concerns that this could lead to more fraudulent or negative um, behavior on part of players if we overshare the nature of the investigation. Um, and so we ask that, that do you all take another look at, at that language, potentially. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Talonia, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, Talonia, policy advisor at the Arizona State Senate. I had a um, comment regarding the remedies section under R19-4-226. Um, there, it indicates that the department may fine or otherwise sanction licensees for violations of the statute or the administrative rules. And I, um, and both curious to know if those fines will be um, outlined and published um, as well as you know whatever menu of sanction options that the department uh, may take and to the extent that they are it'd be great to know where they are to the extent that they're not my comment would be that the department outline um, what the monetary fines um, and non-monetary sanctions would be okay great thank you for that We'll go with Kevin, followed by Meredith. Thank you. Um, Kevin Cochran with DraftKings. I was just wondering whether you guys um, could share an update to the timelines. I know last week when you spoke, you said that um, an updated timeline may be coming out with the public comment rules or right around then. Um, and we were just, just trying to get our resources aligned so we can get those turned around quickly. And do you still anticipate about a week to have them turned around from um, stakeholders as well? Uh, so we're, we need to kind of take into consideration how much feedback we're getting over the weekend. So we will have a better idea, let's say, uh, Wednesday of this week. Our, I, ideally, we will have the uh, drafts turned around as well as, um, as well as an updated timeline. But we just don't know yet how much feedback we're getting. But we'll have a better idea 
Tuesday or Wednesday. Great, thank you. You bet. Meredith, you're up. Hi there, I believe this pro comment probably would have been suited for issue set number one, specifically around change control um, rule 19-4-206. Um, the proposed rules uh, require written approval for any changes, internal control systems or any material changes from the department prior to implementation. So we asked for additional details and clarification on what constitutes a material change. Okay, thank you, Meredith. Any any further uh, feedback or comments on any of the uh, fantasy sports rules? Andrew has raised his hand. Yes, I just wanted to make a clarification before, and I, I thank you for for pointing it out. The, the rule reference that I had made in relation uh, to the customer complaint piece was in error. It was in relation to the event wagering, but it's the exact same rule. In fantasy, it's just under 19-4-227A. Uh, yep, great. Thank you, Andrew. All right, any, any more takers for input? And while we're kind of waiting, again, we're keeping the written comments uh, open until 11.59 p.m. Uh, today. Uh, and as you heard with my discussion with Kevin, uh, we are looking to turn around uh, another draft, uh, incorporating some of the feedback that we've received uh, and get that out as soon as possible for uh, further public comment, as well as an updated time frame uh, for moving forward. Again, generally our goals uh, are still to have uh, the rules up and operating by early uh, July, uh, and then probably sometime in August, fantasy sports uh, in late August would be able to move forward. Um, and then event wagering, even though we're not talking about event wagering here today, uh, should be our goal is still September 9th, which has uh, been out there for a while. So any, yes, go ahead, Matt. We have Brandon and then followed by JR. All right, Brandon, floor is yours. Uh, thank you uh, for the time today. Um, just wanted to bring up and, and ask for clarification. I'm, I'm looking up the specific reference at the moment, but uh, it's related to one of your audit requirements, uh, specifically where it references that the department shall be authorized to confer with the independent CPA during the audit process and to review the independent CPA's work papers. We, we would just ask as a CPA, um, as, an, as an auditor, um, does this mean that Arizona and the, and the Department of Gaming would have the ability to review our papers upon request? Or are you looking or expecting to be able to provide input during the audit and input on the audit? So just a, a clarification and some synchronization with kind of typical uh, AICPA guidance on audit work papers and audit guidance. Uh, Brandon, before I'm going to have uh, Warren Nichols uh, answer that question, but just for the record, uh, who do you represent? Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Yes, I apologize. So this is Brandon Leshner with uh, Ruben Brown um, LLP. It's a CPA and accounting firm, specialized uh, gaming practice. Um, and I was specifically asking about um, section. Um, oh, sorry, I need that number again. Warren's not. Where it's at. <laughs> yeah, two hundred six G. Sorry. Yeah. So so Brandon, uh, uh, what we would do there. Uh, we would uh, want to look at the records after the completion of the audit. Uh, that would be upon request, and we would do that uh, with a release from, uh, we would submit a release to the operator that's being audited, and, and they would sign that, and then we would have that available for the CPA firm. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Great, thank you, Brandon. JR, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is JR. I and uh, with the Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation. I uh, apologize that you clarified this before. I'm seeking further clarification from your statements there about timelines for public comments. If I understand correctly, uh, you're saying that these, uh, the Article 2 here for fantasy contests will be republished with, the, with updates, and so a further public comment period will be available for these. Is that correct? 
Yeah. Uh, again, because we we anticipate making changes uh, to these rules based off the feedback we've been receiving. So once we've uh, made those changes, uh, we'll put the the uh, new rules out uh, for public comment. Thank you very much. And a follow up there is that also true for Article One event wagering? It is. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And then finally, and I believe I, I did, you did clear, you did state this, so my apologies for, for clarification on my end. The anticipated timeline, subject to you know how, how many comments are being submitted um, for, especially for event wagering, uh, for Article One event wagering, for the republication of the draft rules is about a week or so. And then, then, another, and then about another week after that will be open for public comment. Is that the anticipation? Uh, again, uh, we will have an updated timeline. Our, our hope, and again, it's going to be dependent on the amount of feedback we've received, is to turn around a draft as quickly as possible. Uh, so, you know, ideally it would be sometime late this week. But again, I'm just going to caveat that with we, we won't know until the written public comment period closes tonight at 11.59 p.m. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. You bet. Meredith, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. I just wanted to provide some comments on draft rule 19-4-204D, the licensing of indirect parent organizations. Um, the proposed rules suggest that companies holding uh, an ownership interest or voting rights of 10% or more may be required to obtain licensure. Um, no other jurisdiction where we currently operate fantasy sports has this requirement for licensure of parent organizations. So I'd like some clarification when, when the proposed language says that it may be required, how will that determination be, be made? Sorry, Meredith, we're conferring over here. <laughs> so, so Meredith, uh, this is Warren Nichols. Um, the, the best that I can offer is it's sort of an unusual situation where the statute says that you know holding companies may be uh, licensed. So, uh, what what we're intending is that if it's determined by our vendor certification unit uh, that they feel they need to be licensed. Uh, then, then they will be. Uh, it, it's a very, as far as what that, um, what those criteria will be. That you know, that's really a, a question for our vendor certification unit, you know, based on their experience and knowledge of of, uh, of gaming and and determining sort of what that arm length is and if that's uh, if the holding company needs to be licensed or not. So it's probably based on, again, off the top of my head, it's going to be based on sort of the level of control that they have over the operation. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Meredith. Any any further comments? Brandon, uh, is your hand still up or or? Oh, there we go. Okay. I apologize. That's all right. That's all right. All right. Um, sort of last call on any input. Again, thank you everybody for participating today. Um, again, if you uh, want to make further comments, we'll keep that uh, the written comment period open until 11:59 p.m. tonight. Uh, we'll uh, once we've taken a look at the feedback we've received, we will come out with a uh, with new rules and a updated time frame. But again, just for kind of the, the general time frame we're looking to have rules completed and up and running uh, by early July and then our target for fantasy sports uh, is right now late August but we will look into that and see if we can go ahead and uh, get a more fixed date so I appreciate all your input and uh, you'll be hearing from the department shortly thank you everyone